ಸರ್ವೋಪನಿಷದ ಗಾವೋ ದೊಗ್ಧಾಗೋಪಾಲನಂದನ ಪಾರ್ಥೋವತ್ಸ ಸುಧೀರ್ ಭೋಕ್ತ ದುಗ್ಧ ಗೀತಾಮೃತ ಮಹತ್ As we begin this Srimad Bhagavad Gita lecture series together, I want to thank you for joining me. We're going to start right away. It's 5,000 years ago. Ten days of the Mahabharata war have finished. And after that, in Hastinapur, one of Dhrutrash's ministers, Sanjay, is making his way to Dhrutrash's bedroom late at night. He reaches outside of the bedroom and there are two guards standing there Sanjay tells them, I need to go and immediately meet Dhrutrash. I have important information for him. The goods, guards look at each other and they tell Sanjay that Dhrutrash, because of the war, is suffering from insomnia. He's not able to sleep. And if you go and bring him any news right now, then his mind will get lost in that information. And so whatever sleep he's bound to get, he'll lose that as well. So do reconsider if you have to give him this news or not. Sanjay says, I have to give him this news. It's incredibly important. You must let me in. And while he's saying this, Dhrutrash from inside of the room, he hears Sanjay's voice and he calls him in. Sanjay enters the room. And as soon as Sanjay enters the room, Dhrutrash feels a change take over him. Sanjay is a pious soul, Punyatma. And Dhrutrash is a sinner, Papatma. And just the presence of a pious soul near the sinner He makes him feel something special on the inside. The way you don't need to be told when you're walking down, when you're walking past a bakery. It's just the smell of the bakery. It hits you. It awakens something within you. In the same way, just being near a, a pious soul, it awakens something in Dhrutrash. Dhrutrash looks at Sanjay. He's blind. But in his general direction, he says, What are you here for? And Sanjay moves very close to Dhrutrash's ear so that nobody even outside can hear. And he whispers to him two words, Pitamaha Hataha. Pitamaha Bhishma Pitamaha has passed away. And as soon as Dhrutrash hears this, he's vexed. Impossible. What you're telling me is impossible. Bhishma Pita is unkillable. Bhishma Pita has a gift from the gods. When he was much younger, his name was Gangeya. And he took a vow of celibacy. And that vow of celibacy impressed the gods so much that the gods came onto earth and they told Bhishma, they told Gangeya that your vow is so Bhishan, is so strong that from this day forward your name is Bhishma. And our gift to you is that you can choose when you want to die. It's in your hands to choose the time and location of your own death. So Dhrutras tells this story again to Sanjay and he says, you're telling me that Bhishma is dead. It's impossible. It is impossible for someone to kill Bhishma. So I want you to tell me, from the beginning, how all of this happened. Who was it that killed Bhishma? And then Sanjay says, it was Shikhandi. Shikhandi! Dhrutrash, he's so angry, he said, Shikhandi is the one who killed Bhishma? How can a fox kill a lion? How can a pebble eradicate a mountain? Do you understand who Bhishma is? Bhishma is like a thousand summer suns. Nobody can even stand in front of his light. Bhishma is like a hurricane. Anyone who even passes by him will be pulled by him. Bhishma is like a flowing river. Even standing by his banks is at a risk. You're telling me that Shikhandi was able to stop Bhishma? Impossible. Where was everyone else? Where was Arjun? Where was Yudhishthir? Where was Bhim? Where was Nakul? Saldev? Karna? Yuyutsu? Where was everyone else? Where was my son Duryodhan? Where was Dushasan? What direction were they facing? Where did all of this take place? And one by one, one by one, Dhrutrash is just spewing questions at Sanjay. Sanjay says, pause. Let me tell you what happened. Ten days ago, in the month of Maksha, this is all happening place. Ten days ago, in Kurukshetra, 18 Akshohini worth of soldiers gathered. 18 Akshohini is roughly 4.8 million soldiers. Sanjay says, Duryodhan organized his army. He had 11 Akshohini. And on the other side, Krishna Bhagavan organized the Pandav army. They had seven Akshohini. They're outnumbered. Now it's not just seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. It's not a gap of four Akshohini. Four Akshohini is roughly the population of South Dakota. I've looked it up. So on one side is just the Pandavs and their army. On the other side is that many soldiers plus the population of South Dakota. And in the morning, 
before the day of the war, on Maksha Sud Dasham, Krishna Bhagwan tells Arjun, he says, we are tragically outnumbered. Now, if we want to improve our opportunity in war, if we want to improve our chances of winning, we need to get some divine intervention. So you and me, let's come up with a plan. Arjun folds his hands and he says, Krishna Bhagwan, you guide me. What divine intervention can we ask for at this time? Krishna Bhagwan looks at Arjun and he says, near our lake, called Brahma Sarovar, let's build a small temple to Katyayani Devi. We'll do a chandi part. We'll sacrifice one of our soldiers from the army to get Mata onto our side. And Krishna Bhagwan, the day before the Mahabharata war started, took Arjun, made a sacrifice, and did a chandi part. This is all written in the Mahabharata. Quite often, sometimes in this world, we have these prejudices in our mind that one god, one dev, or one devi is superior to the other. If we look in the scriptures, we'll see that they all behave equally with each other. Many years ago, Pramukh Swami Maharaj, in one of the BAPS mandirs, he installed all the different murtis of God. Ramchandra Bhagwan, Shankar Bhagwan, Krishna Bhagwan, and Bhagwan Swami Narayan. And so someone made a passing comment that when you shut the doors or you shut the curtain, won't all the gods argue amongst each other? Pramukh Swami Maharaj said, gods have no issue amongst each other. It's people like you on this earth that have very small minds that think gods have an argument amongst each other. People have arguments amongst, against each other, not gods. Krishna Bhagwan takes Arjun and on Maksha Sud Dasham, the day before the Mahabharata war started, he did a chandi part. Then, it's early in the morning. Sanjay tells Dhrutrasht, Maksha Sud Ekadashi, even before the sun rose, both armies arise. And they're saying one word, Yudjitam, 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 get ready, get ready, get ready. Both armies, they gather all of their soldiers. The Kauravs are facing west, the Pandavs are facing east. And at that time, Yudhishthir looks towards Arjun and he says, how should we organize our army? We're outnumbered. What type of Vyurachna, what type of organization should we use for our, our army? And at that time, Arjun tells Yudhishthir that when we were studying the rules of war, I remember from one of our lessons that when you're outnumbered, you should make the front part of your army very sharp. So let's make a Vajra view in the shape of a lightning bolt. And at the very front, Suchi Mukam Anikam Syat. Our, our army should be very sharp. Who will we put at the front? Let's put Beam. Because Beam, with his mace, is such a strong fighter that if he had to fight against the ocean, he could drive the entire ocean, exhaust the ocean, but he wouldn't get exhausted. They agree internally. And then they stand for war. And right as they're standing, as the sun is rising, Arjun looks at the Kaurav army and he sees Bhishma Pita. In front of him is Bhishma Pita who has long white hair, a long white beard. His crown, his headdress is made out of silver. His armor is made out of silver. His chariot is made out of silver. Everything is shining. And as the sun is rising, in front of the sun, Bhishma shines like the moon. That's how Vyasji has described the entire scenario, the environment. And while Arjun is watching this, a gust of wind flies, comes from behind the Pandavas and towards the Kauravas. Now as the wind is coming from behind the Pandavas, is gathering all the smell of the Pandavas. The Pandavas, many of them haven't bathed first thing in the morning. And there are all of these animals. And as the smell gets more and more rancid, it hits the first line of the Kauravas and the first line of the Kaurav army starts to vomit. And now that smell of the vomit starts to get added to that already putrid smell and the second line begins to vomit, third line begins to vomit, fourth line begins to vomit. And with that wind, there's a big cloud of dust that forms. And everyone starts to scatter amongst both armies as they try to get their armies back into a proper formation. At that time, Sanjay tells Dhrutrash, Arjun, because of the wind and the dust cloud, his hair became loose out of his headdress. As he was putting his hair back behind his eyes, he was tying it behind his head, he told Krishna Bhagwan, I want you to take my chariot between both armies. Before the war started, I saw where Bhishma was standing. I saw that next to Bhishma was Duryodhan. On the other side of Bhishma was Dushasan. I saw that next to Dushasan was Ashwatthama. And next to Ashwatthama were the other soldiers. But now, I'm worried that maybe they've moved some of the warriors around. I want to see them again. 
So take my chariot between both sides of the between both armies. Sena yor ubayor madhye, ratham stapaya mechuta. And when Sanjay tells this to Dhrutrash, Dhrutrash stops Sanjay. He says, stop. You've told me about some of the warriors and where they were standing. I want to know in full detail where everyone is. Where is Yuyutsu in this? And Sanjay says, I left Yuyutsu out on purpose. Yuyutsu is Dhrutrash's oldest son. While Dhrutrash and his wife Gandhari, while Gandhari was pregnant with Duryodhan, she was pregnant for two years. So Dhrutrasht, being the king, the de facto king at the time, was worried about his lineage. So he sired another son with his handmaiden named Sovali. That son is actually the oldest of the Kauravs. That son's name is Yuyutsu. And for Dhrutrashtra, Yuyutsu is his insurance policy. He's got 101 other children, 100 other boys and one daughter named Dushala. These 101 children he knows are at risk because they have two bad parents. But Yuyutsu only has one bad parent, Dhrutrashtra. Sovali is a good mother. So for him, for Dhrutrashtra, Yuyutsu is his insurance policy. Sanjay says that at the very beginning of the war, Yudhishthir, he gave an ultimatum. He said, this is my last opportunity that I'm giving to anyone on the Kaurav side. If you want to fight on the side of Dharma, then you have to come on this side. Because Dharma exists where Krishna is. And Krishna is on our side. Yuyutsu heard this and he understood that wherever there is Krishna, there is Dharma, and wherever there is Dharma, there is victory. So at the very beginning of the war, Yuyutsu switched sides. And when he hears that, Dhrutra says the word Sadhu, Sadhu, meaning good, good. He's actually satisfied that one of his children has a chance to survive. And then Dhrutra says, tell me everything. I want to know all the details about what happened in Kurukshetra. And now here, the shlok, the kapta that Dhrutra says, is the first shlok of the famous Srimad Bhagavad Gita that we read today. Dhrutra tells Sanjay, Dharma Kshetre Kurukshetre, Samaveta Yuyutsavaha, Mahamaka Pandavascheva, Kima Kurvata Sanjaya. Sanjay, in Kurukshetra, what were my children and Pandu's children doing? How were they organized when they were preparing for war? Everything I said before this is background. In the Mahabharata, there are actually 31 chapters in the Bhishma Parva that are called the Gita Parva. In those 31 chapters, 18 chapters are considered the famous Srimad Bhagavad Gita that we have today. And this couplet is the very first couplet, Dharma Kshetre Kurukshetre. Dhrutrash asked Sanjay what everyone is doing. And at that time, Sanjay, he again describes where all the soldiers are standing. Where are the Pandavs? Where are the Kauravs? And how they begin the war. And at that time, Sanjay reminds Dhrutrash that after the wind blew, Arjun tells Krishna Bhagwan, Sena yor ubayor madhye ratham stapaya mechuta. Why? Why does he want his chariot to be taken between both armies? Ker maya sahadiyodavyam. Asmin rana samudhyame. Who am I fighting against? I want to see my enemies. Now this is it. This is the first miracle of the Srimad Bhagavad Gita. The first miracle is not in the 11th chapter when Krishna Bhagavan takes a full form, Vishwarup Darshan. No, the first miracle is that in the Srimad Bhagavad Gita, God's Updesh, God's guidance, the first command isn't from God to devotee, it's actually from devotee to God. Arjun commands God, take my chariot between the two armies. Krishna Bhagavan does as he's told. And Krishna Bhagavan takes Arjun between the two armies and he says, look across and see your enemies. And when Arjun looks, he sees his family. He sees his grandfathers, he sees his uncles, his maternal uncles, he sees his cousins, his nephews, he sees his brothers. And all of a sudden, he is just lost. He is, goes into deep depression, distress. Krupaya paraya vishto. Arjun is overcome with grief. And in that grief, he looks to Krishna Bhagavan and he's unable to say anything to him while he's in the chariot. He gets out of the chariot, goes behind his own chariot, drops his bow, falls to his knees. Krishna Bhagavan is confused. What's happening here in front of all of these millions of people? Krishna Bhagavan gets out of the chariot, goes behind the chariot and sees Arjun on his knees, cowering and sweating. And Arjun looks to him and he says, Bhagavan, Siddhanti Mama Gatrani, Mukham Chaparishushyati, 
वेपतुश्च शरीरे में रोम हर्षश्च जायते गांडिवम श्रंसते हस्तात त्वचे परिदयते न च शक्नोमि अवस्था तुम भ्रमतीव च मे मन भगवान माई इंटायर बॉडी इज शेकिंग माई स्किन इज बर्निंग माई माइंड इज जस्ट मूविंग आई कैन नॉट स्टैंड स्टिल माई माउथ इज ड्राई माई आईज आर फ्लिकरिंग आई कैन होल्ड माई बो एवरीथिंग इज गोइंग रॉन्ग आई डोंट नो वट्स हैपनिंग टू मी and at this point krishna bhagwan looks at him and krishna bhagwan laughs pra hasan eva look at the situation here arjun is sweating he is in fear in complete conflict internally a few years ago there was an article in the economist and it was a very small article about the winters in north india and at that time that small article said that the winters in north india especially that year were so bad that roughly 50 people died because of the cold just the cold killed 50 people in north india that winter this is 5000 years ago in the month of makshar in the winter in kurukshetra in north india in the type of cold that kills people arjun is sweating imagine how bad it must be burning inside for this to be happening and while he's crying krishna bhagwan laughs pra hasan eva when you can go in front of him cry your eyes out and he looks at you and can laugh when his shobhtu soumya mukharvin hasatu hoy then you know you've picked the right keshav and the reason for this is their response will help you get out of your response imagine if you're sick and you go to the doctor and you tell the doctor my throat's been sore for a few days i've been having this fever what do you think's wrong with me and the doctor looks at you and says oh man i don't know but there are a lot of bad things going around right now and i've heard these qualities and these different symptoms from other people and you having them i'm worried and quite a few people have passed away from similar symptoms just recently now you might just have a regular cold but hearing that other people may have passed away from having similar symptoms all of a sudden your disease doubles but if you go to the doctor and you tell him the same thing and your doctor laughs but hasan he laughs and says don't worry about it these types of symptoms are common for so many different things It could be nothing serious at all. We'll do a few simple tests and I have confidence that you'll be okay by the end of this meeting. Then half of our disease goes away in just that consolence. The response we get in our worst times can help alleviate it or help increase that situation. Picking the right guru to help alleviate our pains. This is what Arjun's grief is going to teach us. Arjun then one by one lays out dozens of different arguments about why he doesn't want to fight the war. None of those arguments are good. But he lays them out and one by one Krishna Bhagwan listens. He lets Arjun finish all of his reasons before Bhagwan speaks. There is no Shrimad Bhagavad Gita in the first chapter of the Bhagavad Gita. It's all Arjun Gita. It's all Arjun giving his guidance and his reasoning to Krishna Bhagwan. From the first chapter of the Shrimad Bhagavad Gita, we understand one thing that Arjun had a conflict in his life. That conflict led to depression led to despair in sanskrit that despair is called vishad but he didn't stay in that vishad he didn't try to solve that vishad on his own he sought help from the right person he sought help from guru and from god and by connecting his vishad to god he turned that vishad into vishad yog the entire topic of the bhagavad gita the whole scripture is going to be yog a connection with god Yog is defined as a connection with God. When you take your depression or your frustration or your tension or your stress or any problem you have in your life and you connect that problem to God, your vishad becomes vishad yog. Don't worry about having vishad. Vishad is not the problem. The problem that we have, the mistake we make is that we connected to the wrong person afterwards. Many of the great sages throughout Indian history, throughout Hindu dharma have had vishad in their life, have had some sort of despair. For example, Vyasji, we'll talk about him later in the future in one of the future lectures. But when he had despair in his life, he didn't try to solve it on his own. He went to the sage Narad and he made his vishad into vishad yog and from that we got the Shrimad Bhagavat. When Narad himself had vishad, he didn't try to solve it on his own. He went to the Guru Sanat Sujat. He turned his vishad into vishad yog and from that we get the Bhuma Vidya in the Chandogya Upanishad. The sage Valmiki, he also had despair in his life, but he didn't try to solve it on his own. He turned his vishad into vishad yog. 
And from that, we got the Valmiki Ramayan. Arjun has a problem in his life. He went to the right person. He connected his Vishad to God and turned his Vishad into Vishad Yog. And in the process, we get the entire Srimad Bhagavad Gita. The first chapter of the Bhagavad Gita teaches us a very important lesson. For Arjun, God wasn't in his village. God wasn't far away in his house. God was right in front of him. Standing right in front of him was God. And here he was on his knees in tears. The moment will come in your life and in my life where God will be standing right in front of us and we will have nothing we can say to him except cry. And at that time, it's okay. Because if we take our pain, if we take our frustration, if we take our misery, our despair, our grief, every emotion that we have and we connect it to God, then our vishad can become vishad yog. At the end of the first chapter, Arjun lays out all of his reasons why he doesn't want to fight the war. Bhagwan does not respond. And in the second chapter, when Bhagwan does respond, he'll start to handle the disease, not the symptoms. Until then, I pray that whenever vishad we have in our lives and whenever we have vishad in our lives, we can take that vishad, connect it to God, turn our vishad into vishad yoga. For that, I pray. Astu.